founder of Bungie and the Halo project lead. Halo is the name of this game. And we're going to see, for the first time, Halo. Welcome, Jason. Thanks, Steve. Yeah. Everything you're about to see is being rendered in real time on a Macintosh using OpenGL. The game goes by many names, Halo Combat Evolved, Halo CE, Halo 1, or just simply Halo. It is quite possibly one of the most influential video games ever created when it comes to its impact on console gaming specifically and the more broad cultural impact of the industry. So many basic things we take for granted or just don't even think about in FPS titles, stuff that's just considered basic building blocks like regenerative health or the way that joystick aiming and moving works on a controller, or even the basic idea of, of having two weapons, stuff that appears as so obvious or apparent that it doesn't even register with you, I think a lot of that can be largely attributed to Halo. Halo in particular. Not only did it become an industry-defining trendsetter, but it also took Microsoft and Xbox to a whole new market of people as being the forerunner FPS experience. Originally, Halo was going to be a third-person action game. We did a lot of thinking about what it meant to be an action game, and could an action game be a real-time strategy game, and the answer was no. But the decision to make it first person and ship with its multiplayer mode were really what revolutionized the world. Even if you never played Halo 1 yourself when it launched in 2001, which I also did not on account of being just three years old at the time, but if you've ever touched an FPS game on console in your life, in one way or another, Halo 1 and its influence echoes into that game and the rest of the industry even over 20 years later. Uh, one day my phone rings telling me that um, Bungie's kind of in financial trouble and that they're um, talking to some people about potentially being acquired. It was going to be really important to Microsoft to have games for the Xbox, that's what was going to make or break it. Microsoft taking a massive gamble on this relatively small studio called Bungie, who worked on mostly PC-only titles up to that point, this is what really allowed Microsoft to have some kind of weight to stand against Sony and Nintendo and have some kind of pull in the console gaming market, which was just in its infancy stages of being adopted. Halo 1 shipping with the original Xbox was ultimately the best decision Microsoft made in regards to its relationship with Bungie as well as sales for the Xbox, even though at the time it wasn't clear that that strategy would be successful. Bungie were just working on this really new and weird thing, like so much of the original ideas from Halo ended up being cut. From being more open world, having all kinds of like wild monsters and creatures, including many Covenant enemies scrapped from the game, they knew they wanted some kind of space marine sci-fi action game, but that was what Halo as a brand was ultimately chiseled out of. Huge open world experience quickly dissipated. Bungie has always had a way of finding out what's important in a particular game style and throwing away the extraneous stuff. But still, there was a big problem in their way. Bungie was having both serious financial trouble and creative issues before Microsoft decided to really step in and invest in this project, but this would just be the start of the cultural icon that Halo would eventually become. So how did this revolution happen exactly? It's a very rocky road with many twists and turns, but somehow Bungie managed to make a game that stands on its own two feet over two decades later. So let's go a little deeper and find out how. Halo? Fourth and long. Anybody else? Halo? Halo. Halo. Yeah. Halo. Halo 1 was so far ahead of its time, and not only in the technical aspect. Of course, this was the first console first person shooter game that actually felt good and right to play it on a controller. One of the biggest challenges was making a shooter that really felt right and worked right on a controller. Yeah, I mean, originally you had to struggle with it really being the first FPS that we were trying to get into on a console on a controller with the duke it was huge there was no other game at that point that pulled off this level of polish and finesse in its execution you just needed to hold a controller and interact with the game for about 10 seconds to know that you were piloting something extremely special something about the way the game handled and felt in your hands was just so unique but also the pure personality and style of the game itself was one of its biggest strengths the art direction the setting and so on there was literally nothing even remotely like it at the time even the campaign which we're going to get into more detail soon you know you start 
start playing the first couple of hours, you expect it to be one thing and kind of know what's going on. All seems pretty straightforward at first. You know, you got space marines fighting aliens, pretty normal stuff. Then it completely turns on its head and becomes something else entirely. And the multiplayer got really close to not even shipping with the game, period. We almost cut multiplayer out of it a few days before we had to ship the build because it wasn't really working that well. You know, we were having arguments about how many people can actually connect a box together. We're like, yeah, maybe in college dorms people will do it, but who's going to carry a TV to their friend's house? Everybody was pushing to keep multiplayer in, but none of us knew just what it would mean. According to Bungie, most people in the studio felt that it wasn't really working and it would be a major error to ship it on the final build. But a few people pushed really hard to allow it to be with the printed discs, and without its multiplayer specifically, there's a massive chance Halo would have never turned into the social and cultural juggernaut it would later become, or at least it would have taken a lot longer. And the key to it all was the social element that Halo did establish. Halo is also heavily responsible for the normalization of couch co-op gameplay and social multiplayer as well. A very important note you have to keep in mind, multiplayer for Halo 1 has to be framed a little bit differently because while it did have a fully functioning MP mode with maps and weapons to support that classic original Halo Arena format we know and love, it was not available online yet. Online multiplayer wouldn't be introduced until Halo 2, and then fully expanded upon until Halo 3. So CE is clearly bare bones when it comes to its features, so much so that it would be totally unfair to compare its amount of content to games from the past 10 years or so. But still, despite that, Halo 1 has a fair offering of, of content that Bungie ultimately did ship with. There's just so much more they wanted to do on this game that just wasn't possible given the budget, technical, and creative constraints they had. But everyone at Bungie internally felt that they had something truly special for Microsoft on their hands, making this brand new IP called Halo. The flagship title for the debut of the brand new Xbox console would finally allow them some kind of real exclusive that gave them a leg up competing in the games industry against Sony and Nintendo in particular. But Halo succeeded in my opinion, not just because it got lucky or anything on the Xbox would have been beloved like this, but I think Halo 1 was a perfect storm of being a great game, revolutionary tech, social features, and way more. Admittedly, being a 20 plus year old game, there are less features to discuss when compared to a modern day video game, but what it does offer is a unique experience that you will truly not find anywhere else. Now, eventually Halo CE would have an anniversary edition in which it saw a graphical update to the campaign, but this has its benefits and its drawbacks that we're going to get to, so I think the best place to start talking about Halo CE is the iconic campaign. You may not have expected this, but Halo 1 has one of the longest campaigns in the entire Halo series, in terms of sheer playtime, oddly enough, however, that isn't necessarily to its benefit. If we're being honest, Halo CE doesn't have the best campaign ever, nor is it my personal favorite, but it is the birthplace of everything iconic about Halo as it exists today. But where I think Halo 1's campaign's greatest strength is, is creating a world full of mystery and intrigue in a way that isn't too on the nose or obvious or told in a way where it feels like the game is holding your hand. It doesn't have the largest weapon sandbox Halo's ever seen. It does have a fairly limited amount of enemy types as well, which get repeated on, but you know, they would expand as titles would progress. But Halo 1's campaign is stripped down in the sense that only the best possible gameplay mechanics, enemies, and weapons made it into the game for the most part. The game opens up with a typical space alien action adventure setup where you come into contact with the alien species called the Covenant. The UNSC is tasked with battling the Covenant and ultimately keeping them away from Earth. As the Covenant board the ship, they wake up Master Chief from his cryo sleep to utilize him on the battlefield. And I want to point something out here. Bungie at the time only had Master Chief as a smaller part of this way larger universe. We want a sci-fi character, a guy in a suit who can go from Earth to space, so we have to worry about him changing clothes, and he just needed to look like, like a space marine. Oh God, what do we call him? Something like uh, the super soldier. And I cannot stress this enough. It's the idea of Master Chief that is appealing to us, not the actual person. And this is where I think the Halo show fundamentally gets it wrong. The person inside the suit matters much less than the concept of Master Chief himself basically a super soldier ultra weapon meant to equalize the battle against the Covenant. Not to say that we don't necessarily care about the character of Master Chief, but the literal person is way less important than the idea of him. And that was the idea 
that players latched onto initially, but I digress. Anyways, before we continue, I should also mention another thing. I will occasionally cut back and forth between the original visuals and the updated anniversary graphics. You know, I'll be using it to make a point here and there. But anyways, Master Chief Awakens goes to the main bridge of the Pillar of Autumn and gets the rundown from Cortana. She explains the situation to you and Master Chief takes her along with him. But you continue to fight off the invading Covenant in the Pillar of Autumn ship. Eventually, you are forced to get an escape pod and go to the Halo ring. And upon crashing on Halo, this is where the game really starts to grip you. These visuals at the time were jaw-dropping to players. Sure, the textures and lighting are kind of dated now, but aesthetically, this still has flair and style to it all these years later. Also, something I noticed throughout this entire campaign, this game has some real teeth and isn't afraid to be brutal at times. It can be vicious without indulging it or coming off as tacky. For example, when literally landing on Halo, that escape pod you came in, when you land, every single marine that was traveling with you is, is just dead, and it kind of doesn't even really acknowledge it a whole lot. It just happens. And also, like, while some profanity is used from time to time in the campaign, it's never out of place or without reason. Each moment that feels harsh or brutal is done Done for a very specific reason and making it effective. And so after crash landing on Halo, you rescue some other marine survivors that are grouped up in these strongholds. You could tell Bungie intended this level to be closer to true open world and it does have the spirit of that, but it's ultimately on the rails when boiled down, but that's okay. This level is fun and allows you to use the Warthog for the first time too. Halo really got it right, not only when it comes to player and, and gunplay control, but how it handles vehicles as well. This is one of my favorite levels in Halo. Halo 1, and while the updated graphics do change how the level's atmosphere feels to some degree, it isn't so dramatic where it becomes something else. However, after this mission, you get to Truth and Reconciliation, your objective is to board a Covenant ship from the Halo surface, and the way this level feels is totally different in the newer graphics compared to its original form. Like, in, in the originals, you're on this, like, desert-like surface that feels somewhat artificial or, or man-made. Something isn't quite right. You can see a planet off in the sky in the distance, but if you look any further, it's just this black unknown abyss. Who knows what's down there? This level feels so mysterious and uneasy in its original visuals, but slap the updated graphics on it, and sure, technically speaking, it's miles better and nicer to look at, I guess, but now you can see the edge of it all. The black abyss is just rocks, leaving nothing to the imagination, and it feels less like an artificial desert and more like a standard sci-fi mountain or something. And that includes being on the Covenant ship too. Up until Halo, aliens in media were most usually portrayed in like the classic dark green, like Roswell kind of aliens, or typically black or gray. But the Covenant have these pinks and purples and bright greens, and it feels way more distinct this way compared to the updated visuals where it kind of just feels more generic alien sci-fi again, but the feel of the old graphics give it this unforgettable, uneasy, and just distinct atmosphere as you go and rescue Captain Keys. You escape the Covenant ship and go back down to the surface of Halo on the beach and the silent cartographer. Speaking about the visuals again, I think it hurts the vibe less when it comes to the outdoor areas in most cases, but when it comes to going underground and really encountering the Forerunner architecture for the first time, the difference is night and day. One of these feels mysterious ominous and foreboding like you literally can't see 20 feet in front of you the only thing your eyes can pick up are the glow of covenant shields plasma grenades and whatnot but you flip on the updated graphics and all of that mystery and imagination is just gone you can see the entire room in just these blasting fluorescent lights this is also where some of the level design starts to show its age and some of its flaws come into view assault on the control room after going underground this snow level is one of the most repetitive and monotonous levels in Halo's history, with brief periods of difficult encounters or opening up doors, but for the most part, you're in these corridors of Forerunner architecture to do a thing and then backtrack to do another thing. This level is stretched out so much that it honestly feels like half the playtime of the whole campaign is spent here. It's pretty clear that they had to copy and paste a little bit to stretch this level out, either due to budget or time constraints, probably a bit of both, but my god, this level, at some point, you just start autopiloting and wait and just wait for it to be over. So while I don't love the layout of this, and the backtracking can be downright confusing at times, all things considered, it's still pretty standard stuff until you get to the next level where the entire game does a 180. This is the moment where I feel many people became fully captivated by Halo. Cortana tells you that you're not able to use the Halo weapon against the Covenant. It's a forerunner structure meant to contain something. Give me a second to access. 
Yes, the Forerunner built this place, what they called a fortress world, in order to... No, that can't be. Oh, those Covenant fools. They must have known. There must have been signs. Slow down. You're losing me. The Covenant found something. Buried in this ring. Something horrible. And now, they're afraid. The Covenant found something that spooked them, and Captain Keys is in danger of unearthing whatever this thing is. Guilty Spark is the level where Halo 1 goes from being a typical alien versus marine sci-fi game to something completely wild. This level's atmosphere and tone, again, is greatly dependent on the visuals you're playing in. You're in this dark swamp where the unknown is all around you, and you have to move cautiously and avoid walking around aimlessly, but in the updated graphics, you can see everything, and there's far less tension as you try to discover what's really going on and, you know, navigating through the jungle. But you make your way down the Forerunner structure, and as you descend, you find Slaughtered Covenant and some of your own forces as well. Something else is hidden in these shadows, when you find a fallen Marine Jenkins helmet cam to see what took place. There was an accident. You know, friendly fire or something? What do we have, Sergeant? Looks like a Covenant patrol. Badass elite units. All KIA. Sarge! Listen! What is that? Where's that coming from, Mendoza? I don't... There! Get out! Hold still! Hold still! Let him have it! Sergeant, we're surrounded! I love this little bit so much. Halo is the master at show don't tell kind of storytelling. By the time you see the flood, you realize how much the Covenant aren't your only enemy or even your worst one. And now everything is a threat. It's probably one of my favorite levels in Halo and is such an unexpected twist and turn of events that completely changes the entire premise and stakes of the game. So now you have this new threat, the flood, which the Forerunner Oracle explains to you in the library. Unfortunately, speaking from a design point of view, the library is one of the worst levels in Halo period and possibly even in gaming to a point where running through it in the original graphics made it almost unplayable. Throughout the library, you do get some details about the flood, you know, where they come from, how they exist, etc. But the level is so unbelievably linear, confusing and repetitive that it's such a chore to get through it all. And while I feel the updated graphics are pretty much a requirement to play through the level with any kind of cohesion or get through it smoothly, it does hurt the atmosphere a lot in this case. So basically in the level, you have to board these platforms to get through different levels of the library. You keep ascending and going up and up, and these platforms themselves, they have like this interesting purple and blue thing going on in the original graphics and it's really distinct I don't know how else to describe it but you throw on the new graphics and it's just such like generic looking metallic textures I feel like I've seen a thousand times and much of that foreign and strange feeling it should have just melts away I mean to be fair there are some really good moments in this level though like when you open up this big door and a massive wave of flood come after you and such like that's great and I love that but this leads to a turning point in the game where the Oracle and Cortana back battle about activating the Halo weapon. The ring exists as a way to contain the flood. It will kill all life around it large enough to sustain the flood's food needs. It would basically kill everything within about 25,000 light years or so and starve out the flood infection, including you and the Covenant. But of course, you can't let that happen, and Cortana convinces you to go and stop Captain Keys and somehow stop the Oracle from getting someone else to activate Halo 2. The last act of the game is mostly really good with a few major pain points. The very next level, Two Betrayals, is just as bad as the library when it comes to being monotonous and, and dragged out in all of Halo. Like, I know there's many other levels that are somewhat repetitive and do include a large amount of backtracking, but you really feel it in this one. While this level gives you some breaks to like pilot a banshee for a bit or, or something like that or get on a warthog this level is also a complete chore to play for the most part it becomes like actually tiresome at a certain point and i i cannot stress that enough like i get that halo 1 had a bunch of limiting factors when it came to creating the campaign areas get repeated and reiterated throughout all the levels and and that's fine but ce is the clearest example where you can physically feel that stretch that without any filler of this campaign it would honestly be really short like if all the doubling back was removed in these sequences that are repeated over and over again if those you just only did once this campaign would probably be like i don't know five or six hours long instead of the 10 that is generally slated for most people 
But once again, you got to go and save Captain Keys aboard the Covenant ship, but this time, the Flood have already been released. Again, in a level very reminiscent of the first time you boarded, you get some new visuals and scenery and enemies to fight, and it's cool this time because the Covenant are also distracted battling off the Flood. So the way you approach this level is totally your choice. You can, you can go hard and eliminate everything in your path, or you can take a more passive approach and just try to slip past them. Once again, a very similar setup and premise as some of the early, earlier levels. Levels, but this time you fight your way through the Covenant ship now is also infested with the flood only to find Captain Keys completely consumed by the flood and you do what you have to do. No human life signs detected. The captain, he's one of them. We can't let the flood get off this ring. You know what he'd expect. What he'd want us to do. Again, like I said, the game isn't afraid to be brutal at times without really glorifying it at all. These more shocking moments are very tastefully and sparsely used, and more importantly, leaves so much up to your imagination without like overshowing anything. This is a side note, but you know how like some video games have cutscenes that go on for like minutes long, and it's like just over explaining and overshowing everything. Halo is the exact opposite, whether by style design or just because they had no budget to work with. We don't know, but in any case, it's to this game's benefit. But after finally escaping the Covenant ship for the last time, the last thing to do now is destroy destroy the Pillar of Autumn that you arrived in, and more importantly, destroy Halo and prevent it from activating. The campaign ends where it started, except this time, you're fighting the Flood for the most part, with some occasional Covenant encounters sprinkled in and throughout, but this th the way this last level plays, where you need to destroy the vents, essentially, to, you know, kind of overload the system, it is a little clunky from a gameplay perspective, mostly because all the stuff you need is in an armory that's quite far away, unless you, you know, just get it from grenades killing enemies and it does deflate some of the tension it feels like the sequence should have but it's not terrible by any means at this point it's also only flood enemies and afterwards you do need to make an escape from the pillar of autumn in a warthog sequence that for a two decade old game is honestly still pretty solid and holds up relatively well your evac that you had set up gets shot down by the covenant Cortana to echo and the only option left is to take the final aircraft on the ship, but upon making it in time and just barely escaping, the ending finally plays out. Keep in mind, there is an extra ending for Legendary, and it's, you know, th this extra little bit, but otherwise, you see the Pillar of Autumn explode and the Halo ring starts to collapse as well. It's a somber moment when you realize basically nobody else survived. Then you have the perfect ending shot where Chief removes his helmet. This is the first time you see Chief in any real position of vulnerability minus the opening of the game and more importantly once again it leaves it all up to your imagination and, and, and you know like I said it, it really doesn't matter who's under the helmet it's the idea of Master Chief that everyone found so appealing to some degree we all projected ourselves onto Master Chief and that is literally the core idea of, of why it worked so well with people and the game knows that. As a whole experience more broadly, it's clear that Halo 1 is not some finely tuned masterpiece that had every detail examined and refined. It's definitely rough in some areas, but Bungie clearly had to cut much from what they wanted to include anyways from the final project, but despite all that, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't at least a unique and extremely memorable experience, and for the time that it released in, it was beyond revolutionary, became the new standard going forward, not only for Halo, but more the gaming industry at large. The original visuals have this distinct personality that I think really does get lost with the anniversary graphics. Sure, it's technically better looking, but at what cost? Again, while it's not my favorite Halo game, it absolutely established Halo's basic combat without overcomplicating anything. It's straight to the point, and I respect that a lot. Halo's campaigns do tend to get better after this one, but something about the original is just a great time capsule to examine. But in any case, Halo 1 did indeed ship with a land-supported multiplayer mode, not just campaign, so let's dive into that.
Just gonna lay this out on the table right away. Halo Combat Evolved does not have the best multiplayer in the Halo series. Fun? Absolutely. But well designed and, and balanced? Absolutely not. Its flaws and blemishes are almost laughable in a modern context, but once again, the biggest thing to consider in regards to Halo 1 MP is the fact that it was never designed for online play. No forethought about how, you know, people would play from across the world connecting, no thought into ultra meticulous balance for competitive play necessarily, or like, you know, weapon tuning and so on. I mean, hell, the Magnum is by far the best gun in the game in Halo 1 by a long shot, and this was most likely the result of a small error Bungie made when tweaking the game uh, when printing discs that made the Magnum completely busted. But people loved it so much they never ended up changing it. Point is, Halo 1 MP from its maps to its weapon sandbox and even its format was not made really using the frame of reference that every multiplayer experience is made with today. MP was really just a true extension of the campaign and its mechanics rearranged, not really its own fully fledged game type. This was meant to allow you to play with some of your buddies in the same room, using a few different consoles and, and TVs, you know, it's a very different approach to its creation, but nonetheless, it was the birthplace of the Halo Combat Triangle, the arena format Halo is really famous for, and just the basic groundwork of what would socially, uh, you know, come out of it in following titles, but also the very concept of regenerative of health I think was largely born here, especially in regards to console games. Sure, Halo 1 still had health packs, but these hardly mattered at all. Your real health was your regenerative shield, and that also established the combat triangle of Halo's core gameplay loop. You have plasma weapons that are more effective for shields, and ballistic weapons for when shields are down. All the maps in Halo 1 were built around that very idea, so let's start first by talking about the maps and the sandbox. God, where, where do I begin with some of these maps? Don't get it twisted, a few of them are honestly excellent. They have well-balanced symmetry for this format, it really feels like it rewards creative and, you know, advantageous positioning, and you have to battle fairly for power weapons or items, etc. But other maps are just like, dog, what is going on with this? But as baffling as some of the Halo 1 maps are, especially the, considering the lethality of some of the weapons in the sandbox, I can't help but feel like a lot of them are just a blast to play. You have maps like Chill Out, which not only have that Covenant ship feel from the campaign, it also includes portal mechanics to position on the map elsewhere or escape losing gunfights. It has these walkways with advantageous views, but are high risk areas to put yourself in. There's this map, which is essentially a giant forerunner hallway. The spawns are completely busted and all over the place here, but admittedly, it can be sort of fun getting a triple kill with a magnum across the entire map. Totally unfair, but definitely fun. Also, uh, there are some power-ups that can be attained in each map, an overshield and invisibility. The models are just like these little orbs in, in like a, a polygon, for God's sake. Like, they're so primitive and, and basic that, in a roundabout way, feel more charming to me than some of the extremely technically detailed ones in, in modern Halo. Also, this goes for just about every map. The spawns are horrible, and with the lethality of the Magnum, you can get caught in some mean and unbalanced spawn traps if you get unlucky. But it came to me when I was playing CE multiplayer that while it would for sure not be considered a good multiplayer game by today's standards, like it's just, you know, a different kind of game, I can just imagine this game being a wildly fun time, sitting around the couch with a bunch of friends, all having fun and just enjoying the experience for what it is. Like, it's insanely obvious a, a lot of the core features and quality of life things are missing like the kill feed for example doesn't even show people what weapons are being used or even what team they're on I feel like there's no real feedback when you get a kill either. You know what I mean, right? Like, getting a kill in most FPS games, you generally always get some kind of visual or audio feedback that serves as a cue when you successfully eliminate someone. I feel like Halo 1 has zero cues to this. Sometimes in really intense firefights, the only way to know if you confirmed a kill or not is to check the really clunky and not super useful kill feed. To call it basic or primitive would be an understatement, but again, that's okay. There were no other console FPS games that were competition or doing it better than them at that point. There was nothing to compare it to. It, it was simply a vehicle for allowing the social element of what Halo can be to shine through. 
And above all else, that is where I think personally Halo 1 really ascends and becomes legendary. In terms of the features, weapons, you know, bells and whistles, all the content that Halo games afterwards would have, Halo 1 or CE is for sure the most bare bones of them all. But the beauty lies in its relative simplicity. They cut away all of the unnecessary fat and just boil the experience down just to be a, a fun couch co-op game. Nothing more, nothing less. Halo Combat Evolved has no Forge mode or custom games browser or any of these social features that would become responsible for making it that cultural icon eventually. Yet still, it's, it's a charming little game in and of itself, extremely simplistic yet very effective. Obviously, the MCC makes Halo 1 multiplayer available online, but playing it, it definitely feels like it taking it what it was supposed to be out of context when putting it in that environment. And also, to put it lightly, the arena format was essentially the next big thing, right? Obviously, battle royales have, you know, kind of dominated gaming the past couple of years, but at that time, that was what arena shooters were, and in particular, Halo was the juggernaut and the one that was obviously doing the best as a result of that, but, you know, Know, it literally had its place, it had its work already cut out for it. So I feel like there actually isn't much else to cover with CE's multiplayer. It's pretty straightforward and basic. I did have a really fun time for the most part going back and experiencing it, and without a doubt, it's one of the core reasons why the legacy of Halo was even initiated in the first place. Halo Combat Evolved was a whole lot more than just your average space combat sci-fi game. It was a technological revolution as well as a social one, and a trendsetter for decades to come. Halo 1 was not the game that I personally fell in love with the Halo series with, but I know many did, or many went back to appreciate it, and all I can say is there really is a reason that it hasn't been forgotten.